Good evening and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 32nd year, I interview writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished in the past, what they're planning for the future. It's a wider net than writers, however. Sometimes we have had on sculptors, painters, uh, musicians, actors. So if you have an idea for a writer who's a good fit for the writer's block or another brand of artist, watch for our address at the end of the show. We'd be very happy to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the writer's block and all the other original programming that comes out of 1623 Studios is a result of cable access television. It's a valuable <laughs> community asset and you don't get it with DISH or any other means of accessing the net. So you stick with the writer's block, stick with cable. As you can see, we're back on the Zoom format because the last couple of shows of this season will be, it will have to be on Zoom because of the Omicron crush. We are back on the protocols for from last year, but we'll be back in the studio next season, I hope. <laughs> Tonight, I'm very happy to say we do have a guest who is a writer. She is returning to the writer's block after uh, an away time of about 12 years, but I'm very happy to welcome back Bonnie Hurd-Smith. Welcome to the show, Bonnie. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, it can't be 12 years. It well, really can't be. <laughs> Maybe it, it think, can't even be 10. I, I think it's 2010. Yeah. So, well, the beginning oh, of the 12th. Oh, well. Years. I'll double check on Time that. flies. <laughs> it's great to see you. Uh, it's run, wonderful to have you back. Uh, uh, to our audience, Bonnie Heard smith is a, an accomplished historian on women's history, especially in the country, but especially in New England with a focus even on Massachusetts. And she's written extensively on it. We're going to talk today, at least start to talk today, about a recent updated reissued book of Bonnie's called We, we Believe. Go home, please. Go I thought you were waiting for me. No, no. We Believe in You 12 Inspiring Stories. Can you raise it up? I don't remember my own title. 12 Inspiring Stories of Courage, Faith, and Action from American Women's History. Yes, and that is. Uh, Louisa May Alcott on yeah. the cover as a young woman, maybe 18, 40, 20. 40 ish. Yeah. 40 ish. You think she's 40 there? Well, wow. yep, sir. She, she looks great. The 18th century. So did I when I was 40. So <laughs> did you. <laughs> the, the 18th century must have been good for complexion. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read off those 12 women's names, if I may. And uh, then I'm going to ask some questions. and. Uh, See if I can get you to read maybe a passage. The, oh, women, the, the women you uh, have profiled are Abigail Adams, Louisa May Alcott, Anne Bradstreet, Lydia Maria Child, Margaret Fuller, Edmonia Lewis, Judith Sargent Murray, about whom I want to emphasize because of your history with her, Elizabeth Peabody, Sarah Parker, Remond. 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 Yeah. Maria Stewart, Lucy Stone, and Phyllis Wheatley. When did you get the idea for this book, Bonnie? And how long did it take you to do these profiles? Well, I got the idea for the book eight years ago or so. And at that time, I'd been doing a lot of writing of articles and a lot of speaking and a lot of Unitarian Universalist sermons about women in UU history. And just within a sermon, you, you need to say something inspiring, you know, sort of what is the point? Why are we listening to the story of this woman's life? And I just kept running into more and more inspiring stories within the Unitarian Universalist heritage to write sermons about, and that includes 
about half of the women you just listed. And then the others I've encountered along the way through my work on the Boston Women's Heritage Trail, the Salem Women's Heritage Trail. And I wanted to do another book and I, and I wanted to do, I wanted to focus on those three aspects of their lives, their courage, their faith, and um, what was it? I'm sorry. Um, anyway, uh, that I it just I I wanted to get a book out, and rather than do one long biography of somebody, I just thought I would do short stories, really focus, and and you can see in the format of the book, it's really yeah. designed for uh, a younger audience, but also a quick reading audience. Yeah. You know, to get, I, for yeah. example, to get right to the point with bullet points, right. like, who is this woman? What did she do? Give me the bullet points. Yes. What are the key things? What do I need to know? Why should I know it? And then I go into detail. I, I want to emphasize to our audience that uh, the, the novelty of this book is, uh, is very uh, attracting. It's not a traditional stodgy kind of biography. She did this, she did that, she went here, she went there. It's very accessible and it has, as you say, bullet points and uh, a list of places where you can learn more about each of these women. And it's very, very educational. I found it enjoyable, a very relaxing read. And uh, especially the, the list of uh, where you can find out more. We're gonna visit yeah. some of those places if it ever gets warmer. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. So this um, book, the book took you about eight years altogether. No, I, I had a lot of the material because again, I'd been doing these sermons and talks and walking tours. And I, so I, I knew the material very well. And even though the title of the book says women in American history, all of those women are from Massachusetts yeah. and Northeastern Massachusetts <laughs> or, and, or Cape Ann and or Cape Ann. So, but they, but when you read their lives, what they did had a national and in some cases yeah. international impact. So that's why it, the first version of the book I did said Massachusetts women. And then I thought they're American women. And so that's, yeah. Yeah. so it didn't, it, I don't know. It probably took me uh, probably about a year to really put it together. And as you know, I do my own publishing and my own book design. So then that took some time, a uh -huh. couple of years, maybe. A couple of years, yeah. Yeah. And where, where can uh, viewers purchase this book? Purchase mm -hmm. We Believe in You. Well, two places right now, Amazon, no surprise. But then uh -huh. also my own website, bonnieherdsmith.com and Herd is spelled H-U-R-D, so bonnieherdsmith.com or Amazon, because I'm using Amazon's Kindle publishing to do the uh -huh. publishing. Uh -huh. So they, you order it, they manufacture it and send it to you. Okay. Um, I want to so. repeat, you're, you're, you're Bonnie, B-O-N-N-I-E, Herd, H-U-R-D, Smith. And if they buy from your website, you don't have to pay Amazon. That's their, right. You their, don't have their, to pay their, their big bite. Good old Jeff. And, you, yeah. and you'll get a signed copy. If you yeah. buy it directly from me, you'll have a signed copy. Signed copy. Good. Yes. Good. I'm, uh, I'm going to use your mention of Cape Ann as a segue into my next question, because I know you have a long history with the legacy and the personality of Judith Sergeant Murray. Can you tell us a couple of things about Judith Sergeant Murray and how you first became acquainted with her way back when you were way a couple of years back. younger? <laughs> I first became acquainted with her through one branch of my family because I became involved with the Sergeant Murray Gilman Huff House Association now known as the Sergeant House Museum. And in Gloucester. In Gloucester, Middle Street. And that was Judith Sergeant Murray's home. 
at one time. And I became just out of curiosity, not because of her necessarily, because we didn't know much at that time. And I just was, I, I mean, I loved the house. I loved Gloucester. I just wanted to be involved. And I was very intrigued with what little we did know about her. Um, the house has an original copy of her book, 1798, The Gleaner, in which she publishes a number of essays, including just really outspoken, clear thinking, drawing on history, essays about female abilities, as she put it. And she championed female education at a time when we were as a new fledgling nation trying to decide things like education and who got to be a citizen and who should be or could be involved politically. So I, I was just stunned by what I was reading and the fact that I'd never heard of her before. That okay. was the killer. Well, you were from Lexington originally, I is that am right? from Concord. Or Con Concord, excuse me. Oh. <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean to <laughs> hurt your feelings. I was getting no, mixed sorry. up with yeah, the revolution. Well, You're from great. Concord. I'm from Concord. How, how did you get wind of Judith Sartre and Mary way off in Gloucester? Not until I was at Simmons College as an undergraduate and I was studying American history. I mean, I was in love with colonial history, being from Concord. I just it captured my imagination, had never heard of her. And I was um, undergrad at Simmons in the history department and doing a specialty in women's studies. And one Thanksgiving dinner, sitting next to my older cousin, Elizabeth Huff, uh, may she rest in peace. And I told, she asked me what I was learning in school. And I told her I was trying to find a subject for, um, an undergraduate thesis and she said well why don't you come to Gloucester to the Sergeant Murray Gilman Huff house and we have her book we don't know very much about her and I said sure and I started driving up there and literally reading her book the 1798 book the gleaner by candlelight because I thought it would be poetic and, it, and uh, we had a live-in caretaker at the time who was wonderful. And I would just drive up and sit and read by candlelight and just, why have I never heard of this person? And I went back at one point to um, my professor, women's studies professor, Lori Crumpacker, who currently lives in Gloucester. And I said, I think this is really big and a lot of people have never heard of her. And she said, this is really big and it's all yours. Go for it. So. Good professor, good, good. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Just, uh, and we, she and I are, have remained close. I mean, long after my undergraduate days. So I got involved with the house, with Judith. I learned what I could, but I ran into the so-called fact that everybody else did that all of her personal papers had long ago been destroyed and I believed it so I thought well you know that's we'll do what we can but we don't have letters journals diaries all that except when I became president of the board in 1990 at the at a very tenderly young age um it was it was at that time that the Unitarian Universalist minister, Gordon Gibson, contacted us and told us that he had found her letter books, which are blank volumes into which you make a copy of your correspondence. Mm -hmm. Important men did this. George Washington, the president of Harvard, and of course they had male secretaries to do it for them. But in those days, pre- everything you know you would hand write a letter and then you would hand write a copy of the letter into your letter book were they were they sometimes also called commonplace books um i think that commonplace books had other things in them uh. um 
I'll have to look that up. I've seen that, I've seen that term. Right, through. right, right, right. Um, so, uh, by the I, way, I'll have to look that up because, well, go ahead. I was going to look it up right of, now. <laughs> your, your cousin, Miss Huff. Yes. Her family was involved in the house. Yes. Was she living at the house at that time when you knew her at Thanksgiving? She was not living in the house. She had two homes at that time, one in Cambridge and one in Gloucester on Washington Street. But she was, as a volunteer, you know, she was a lifetime board member, very involved in the house for years and years and years. So that yeah, the fourth was... owners, the four, I'm sorry, the fourth owner of the house was Benjamin Kent Huff the first, who was an attorney and a universalist. So, so there's a big universalist connection with that house. But the house well. then already from when you spoke to your uh, to your cousin at Thanksgiving and then through up to and past 1990 was already dedicated to Sergeant Murray's memory and her her legacy. It it actually wasn't um, for largely political reasons. Um, she really did not have champions within her family. She, although let me come back to that. First of all, she died in Mississippi. So she didn't have immediate descendants in the area to sort of carry on her legacy in the way that people like Lucy Stone have had. Um, she did have in the, in the younger generation, she did have some nieces who became very involved with William Lloyd Garrison and his abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. So she had an, an impact on some of those people that they were doing abolition and, and being strong women writing and speaking about abolition and, and she helped raise them. So I, I think see. that there's an impact there. But her daughter died very young no no more kids just the one daughter and in the sergeant family genealogy published in 1923 uh the editor of it was a man a male just a male cousin of hers who didn't like her <laughs> and so basically said she's probably best remembered for her, the symbols these cookies that she has a, had a recipe for. She's better, she's probably best remembered for the symbols than, than her writing because it's pretty mediocre. So yeah, her own yeah. family downplayed her. And then by the time when the museum was set up as a museum in the early um, 1900s and John Singer Sargent, and I see you have a painting over your shoulder by Sargent, her great sure. great nephew, the, the daughters of Edward Boyd. I, I, one of my favorites. Um, it was the minister of the what was then the Universalist Church who really had the idea of, of turning it into a historic house museum to learn about Gloucester's colonial history, maritime history, Universalist history, and John Murray. Uh, that's who my next biography should be about, her husband, John Murray, just a, a rock star in universalism, absolute, and and in colonial times, and I mean, he served as a chaplain under George Washington, I mean, he, that's a whole other show, but anyway, the universalists had the idea, the sergeants had the money, so, because if you think about the historic house tradition, the houses are usually named after the important, usually man who lived there. No one with the last name Sergeant actually lived in the house because Judith was Judith Sergeant Stevens from her first husband when she first lived there. And then she was Judith Sergeant Murray. And then they sold the house to Samuel Gilman, who then sold the house to Benjamin Kent Huff. So it should be the Stevens, Murray, Gilman, you know, but politically 
Sergeant family money, Sergeant family name, cachet, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yeah. And, and then, I want to mention that, of course, it still is a historic house, well preserved and watched over, and the public is uh, is, is welcome mm -hmm. to tour it. I don't know the hours, but they can easily, I, I, I've easily, lost track. easily yeah. go to, uh, to the website. I also want to mention when you said that the uh, sergeant, uh, the records of the sergeant family, the genealogy, was published in the 1920s. The mm -hmm. man who did it, a cousin, was a typical paternalistic, misogynist moron, product of his, <laughs> product, product of his age. And that kind of obstacle was consistent through almost all of the women that you profiled. And that comes out very, very strongly in, in yeah. uh, I think, almost all of them. Some of the upper crust people didn't like Abigail Adams, didn't have the same problems that Miss Wheatley would have, but it, it was a recurring a recurring problem. And I wanted to ask uh, if you could <clears throat> point out and maybe read a couple sentences from a profile besides Judith Sergeant Murray's that typifies what you found of value and inspiration in these in these women's biographies. I, okay. I'm, putting you, I'm putting you on the spot here. You are, I know. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read something about Lucy Stone because Lucy Stone, yes. Because of her work to secure women's right to vote. And here we are in 2021, still fighting for the right to vote for women and but especially people of color. Um, I think she's especially impressive because she is maybe one of the most formidable family obstacles to overcome and become educated. Yeah. Her father was a brute. Yeah. So uh, she could read and, a, and she, yeah. I was going to say, she also, she really didn't want to marry Mr. Blackwell. Um, and he was very, very persuasive. She did not change her last name to right. Blackwell, and they were, and they they did that together. Um, and she was one of the first women to do that. Uh, I'm just, um, but yeah, back back to your earlier point. Two things that really stand out with all of these women is the people who were on their side and the people who were either just not on their side or actively working against them. So Judith Sargent Murray had a father who supported her and John Murray, a husband who supported her and did not try to interfere or stop her. Um, okay. All right, you ready? This is on Lucy Stone. Yes. This is from page 183. 183. She, 183. Okay. Yeah, this is like Bible school, right? Everybody turned to page. <laughs> um, uh, we're in 1847. She is at Oberlin College. She was the first woman to get a college degree in this country from Oberlin. And she's now back home in, in um, Western Massachusetts. Uh, okay, so her brother, okay, let me just start reading there. Back on her home turf, Lucy's brother, Bowman, who was now the minister of the Evangelical Congregational Church in Gardner, Massachusetts, invited her to speak on the rights of women at his church. Her speech delivered, delivered in October, 1847, entitled The Province of Women, launched Lucy's public speaking career. Every other member of Lucy's family disapproved of her address, but the reporters who attended, along with the audience, commented on her extraordinary voice, the command she held over people, 
her use of everyday language versus the usual flowery oratory of public speakers, and the fact that she told stories from real life. In 1848, Sarah Grimke published the groundbreaking Letters on the Equality of the Sexes, which Lucy read. And finally, she heard from the New England Anti-Slavery Society. Lucy Net left North Brookfield, which is where her family home was, to work for them as a paid speaker. They'd sort of been dangling a potential speaking role for her in the past, and so now she finally heard from them. And this was a paid gig, you know? Um, her parents were adamantly opposed, <laughs> perhaps out of concern for her safety, but perhaps not. Regardless of their wishes, Lucy set off. The first speech she gave was in Waterford, Massachusetts. After that, she spoke at churches, town halls, schoolhouses, and outdoors in picnic groves. She spoke without a script. By the fall, Lucy was appearing on posters with William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips. She met, quote unquote, everyone in Boston, including Elizabeth Peabody, who invited her to speak at the evening salons in Boston that attracted transcendentalists, foreign dignitaries, and politicians. Um, just a little bit more. Sure. While abolition was close to Lucy's heart, so were women's rights. And she made an agreement with the New England Anti-Slavery Society to speak against slavery on weekends and on behalf of women during weekdays. Initially, Lucy took up collections after her women's rights talks to pay for posters and pamphlets and to avoid having to charge admission. But that changed as her finances dwindled and hundreds of people at a time gladly paid an admission fee to hear Lucy speak. By 1848, following her appearance at the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York, Lucy was attracting crowds of 2,000 to 3,000 people. In 1850, at the first annual Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, despite a sudden illness, Lucy appeared at the opening ceremony. That is very impressive. It was She's very, very, rare, impressive. very rare for women to speak at all. And she, yes. she had a very successful career as a, a speaker. Right. It was during the days of abolition and women's suffrage that women did speak for the first time. Mariah Baldwin is, I'm sorry, Mariah Stewart is another woman in this book. And she is the first, um, I, well, um, she's the first woman, black or white or anything else to speak in public before a mixed audience. Mi mixed at that time meant men and women. And that happened at the African Meeting House on Beacon Hill in Boston. So these were moral issues. I mean, they're still moral issues. All of all the conversations going on now about voting rights and, and who should be allowed to vote and have access to the ballot. The, these are moral questions then yeah. and now. And there we're still fighting those racism, right. uh, uh, sexism, uh, yeah, inequality and in, in income yep. and still yep. continuing going on. Lots of isms still yes, out yes, there. Yes, yes. Uh, I want to mention again all the names of the women who are profiled in this book because uh, it's an impressive list. I hadn't heard of all of them. I'm very glad to have learned about a couple. Abigail Adams, the mother of the second president. I know the, the the wife of the second president, the mother of the sixth president. Anne Bradstreet, or Louisa May Alcott, who's on the cover. Anne Bradstreet, the poet. Lydia Maria Child, Margaret Fuller, Edmonia Lewis, yeah. Judith Sargent Murray, Elizabeth Peabody, Sarah Parker Remond, Maria Stewart, Lucy Stone, and Phyllis Wheatley, yeah. uh, whose name is from the ship she came over on and the yes. man who brought her. To the, uh, yes. to the new world. The book is. We believe in you. We believe in you by Bonnie Heard Smith with Louisa May Alcott looking 
very strong and piercingly off the cover. I urge everybody to go get a copy. It's really fascinating stuff and with information about how to find out more about these women. We are almost out of time, Bonnie. So I'm gonna to have to begin to wrap up. This was a really good half hour to get reacquainted with you and your work, uh, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is very impressive. You, you compiled a, you. Really, a real strong uh, literary legacy already. And I know you're still going strong. Oh yeah. So thank you for being on the writer's block again, Bonnie, and good luck with your future work. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you for inviting me again. I'll come back again. You're very welcome. I hope Fewer so. Fewer than 10 years. <laughs> I hope so. Yes. Thank you. I want Thanks. to thank our TV audience, too, for being with us on another episode of the Writer's Block. And if you've learned something about women's history, especially New England women's history from Bonnie Heard Smith, and are inspired by the women that she's profiled and, and, and written about, then the Writer's Block has done its job. Thanks very much for being with us. And I hope to see you again next time on the Writer's Block. Good night.